Hi, welcome to Chem with Chem. This is the full work through of the May, June 2021 edition of the CXC CSEC Chemistry Paper 2. This exam was held in July of that year, but it's the same paper we're talking about. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. There are other work throughs that are coming and you don't want to miss them. You can skip or toggle to your desired question using the timestamps on screen. Let's dive in. So a student conducted an experiment to determine the products formed from the electrolysis of aqueous copper two sulfate using inert electrodes. Figure one shows a simplified diagram of the apparatus used. So this is our figure one. So this is our, this is our diagram. I haven't asked us anything um, about the diagram as yet. So this is the procedure. A current was passed through the electrolyte and the starting time was recorded. Or maybe we could just look at the diagram, see which part is the plus. We said we have the battery here. We have, so our battery is here. And of course we see in plus that this side is our anode. This part with the negative is our cathode. We have our ammeter and we have our electrolyte, copper two sulfate, that's equals copper two sulfate. All right, so this is the procedure. A current was passed through the electrolyte and the starting time was recorded. At 10 minute intervals for one hour, the volume of oxygen gas evolved and the mass of copper deposited is measured. At the end of the reaction, the total mass of copper deposited was 4.85 grams. That's important. The volume of gas evolved is shown in table one. So here we are, 10 minutes interval and we get the volume of um, gas. So at 10 minutes, 2.4, 20 minutes, 3.6, 30 minutes, 4.8, 40 minutes, 6 cm cube, and so on. So the first thing we're asked to do here is to define electrolysis. Is the decomposition, that's how we spell that, of an electrolyte by the passage of an electric current. That is it. And just like that, we would have gotten um, two marks. So here we actually suggest one material that could be used as an inert electrode in the, in the electrolysis of aqueous copper to sulfate. So the, the uh, materials that we could use here, we could use platinum, or we could use carbon or what we call graphite, all right? So that's what we would, um, we would give, platinum or graphite. Then using the data in table one, plot a graph of a volume of oxygen measured versus time using the axis in figure two on page seven. And we're supposed to draw a line of best fit. So we have the, the values, we're given the values already, we're going to take these values and we're going to actually use them to plot our graph. All right, so this is the, this is the graph. I've, I've kind of done a little, um, I've, I've kind of put in the, the points where they should go to kind of make life a little um, easy, easier. So what's important whenever we're um, going to plot is that we recognize what we're going up by on each axis. So on the x-axis, one centimeter, each centimeter that we see is representing um, five minutes. And on the y-axis, each centimeter is representing 0 0.5 cm cube. So it means that those little, the tiny boxes that we see, the one millimeter box for the x-axis, each of them would represent one minute. And on the y-axis, the one millimeter box that we see would represent 0 0.1 cm cube. So when we look at this, even before we look at the, the diagram, even before we look at the, um, sorry, the, the plots, we should see that the, we're getting a nice linear, linear relationship. All right, so let's look at what the plot should, what the plot should, should be, or what we're expecting for the, for the plot. So this is what the, the plot should, should be. As I said, it's a, it's an, it's a nice linear plot. We should, we're seeing a nice um, linear relationship Whereas the you know time increases, we're getting an increase in the, the volume of oxygen that is um, produced. And we're doing um, what we call, uh, we're doing a line of best fit. It doesn't always have to capture all the points, but in this case it does. So we'd get a straight line going through that would um, 
of course draw with our ruler. And then the, the next thing that we would need to do to state the volume of gas or state the time, how long it would take for 5.5 cm cube of gas to be to be produced. And what we would need to do, we need to find um, we would need to find 5.5 on the on the y-axis. All right, so we'd find 5.5 on the y-axis. So let's um, find that. So on the y-axis, we would find 5.5, there we go. And we would need to draw a line, straight line coming across from 5.5 and wherever it cuts the line or our graph, we would, or best fit line, we would actually now draw a line coming down from that to, to, to cut the, the x-axis. All right, so when we do that, this is what it um, should look like. When we do that, this is what it should look like. All right, and then from that now we can read off our, our value. So the, um, the value there, that should not be, um, that should not be CM cube, that should be um, minutes. So the time there is, uh, the time there is um, minutes. So having, having done our plot, we would know we'll move on to the other section, C. In um, C, we're asked to identify all the ions present in the electrolyte. Identify all the ions present in the electrolyte. That's, you know, using this experiment. So the ions present here, we're talking about copper sulfate. So if we're talking about copper sulfate, naturally, well, let's, let's use blue. We're going to have Cu2 plus ions. Um, we're going to have sulfate, SO. We want to improve the penmanship. All right, so let's just do this and do this right. So we have Cu, all right. So we're warming back up, I'm warming back up. All right, so we'll have SO4, two minus A plus. It's what, all of that is in the presence of water. It's A plus copper two sulfate. So we would have also H plus, and we would have OH minus. And then from the diagram earlier on, they, they want us to, to identify or state one, well, state P and Q are electrodes in the apparatus used for electrolysis in figure one on page five, which electrode is the anode and which electrode is the, is the, is the cathode. P is the anode. And um, Q is our cathode. All right, next one, right? State one ion in the electrolyte that will drift towards the anode. The anode is positive. So if the anode is positive, it's going to um, have OH minus ions, or we could say sulfate ions drifting over there. An ionic equation for the reaction taking place at the, at the cathode. So this is part four. So the reaction taking place up at the cathode. The cathode is which electrode again? Which electrode is the cathode? The cathode is the negative electrode. We're going to have um, a positive ions going there. Copper two plus ions and H plus ions. And which one is going to be liberated preferentially? The copper is below the H plus, so it would require less energy. So the copper, the copper two plus would actually be given the given the nod, so we would have them gaining electrons to give us Cu solid, all right? Calculate the quantity of electricity that passed through the copper two sulfate solution when 3.5 amperes of, of current flowed for one hour. Quantity of electricity current times time. So they give us all of that. So we know Q equals IT. So from this, we're just going to get straight into it. So we'll say since Q equals IT, we're going to, um, from this, end up with 3.5 amperes times, and we'd have to convert 60 minutes, which that's one hour. So we're converting 60 minutes to seconds. So that would be 60 times 60, which would be 3,600 seconds. And then that should give us what 12 12600 coulombs all right so that's the that's the quantity of electricity that 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 um flowed for for one hour and then in the next part now they want us to calculate the number of moles of copper deposited 
So, all right, the number of moles of copper deposited, we're going to have to take back the equation that we just wrote. That's Cu2 plus A plus plus two moles of electrons to give you Cu, which is a solid. So um, from this, we, we can derive, or it follows that two times 96,500, that's 96,500 is um, the, 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 the charge associated with the flowing of one mole of electrons, or when one mole of electrons um, flow, um, that has a charge of 96,500 coulombs. So two times that amount will actually give us one mole of um, copper, as we have there. So we're going to just write out what this is, 193,000 coulombs, and that would give us one mole of copper, right? So that's one mole of copper, one. One mole of Cu. So if we had the 12,600 that we just calculated up top, right? If we're using that, how many moles would we get? And of course, we'd solve for x. x is 12,600 coulombs times one mole, all of that over 193,000. All right, it's a fraction of 193,000. Um, and that would give us, well, this should be equal. So that is equal to, and I got 0 0.065 moles of Cu. All right, so that's 0 0.065 moles of copper. So with our 0 0.065 moles of copper, we now are asked in the next section to calculate the mass of copper deposited given that the RAM of copper is 64. So we will just take um, the RAM and express it in terms of grams per mole. And we would say mass of Cu is equal to the number of moles that we got just now in part two, 0 0.065 moles multiplied by, um, we're going to use 64. So that would be 64 grams per mole for our copper. And then that should give us 4.16 grams. So just one reason for the difference in the mass of copper calculated in D3 and the mass measured by the students in by the students, 4.85 versus uh, 4.16. So the difference could be difference could be due to the presence of impurities all right state the color change that would have taken place in the electrolyte after a few hours we're expecting the electrolyte to move from to change from blue to colorless so as time goes by you would have the the blue disappearing the student was asked to use the same electrolyte to purify a piece of impure copper state how the electrodes in figure one and page five can be modified to obtain pure copper from impure copper. So we know if we're going to be um, purifying um, copper, we would need to replace the anode, which is a P was the anode. So we would, we would use, use impure copper at P as the anode. And then we would use a piece of, so we'd use a piece of pure copper at Q. That's where we want um, the pure copper to collect on. Um, so we go on to number two. Define each of the following. Acid as we know it, substance, a substance that dissociates, a substance that dissociates in aqueous medium to produce H plus ions or H plus ions as the only positive ions. Or we could say that it is what we call a proton donor. And then a salt now is our substance formed when some or all of the H plus ion in an acid are replaced by the metal or the ammonium ion that should give us that should give us our marks. John dissolved sodium carbonate in water and tested the solution with red and blue litmus paper. The red litmus paper turned blue. However, the blue litmus paper did not change color. State one reason why the 
the red litmus paper turn blue, but the blue. All right, so we'll tell them sodium bicarbonate. So sodium bicarbonate, Na8CO3 is, is basic, all right? And this is um, one mark, so it's basic. We can, just, we can just leave it right there, and we know basis turn red litmus to blue, but would have no change or no effect on, would cause no change or no effect on blue litmus. All right, part two, state whether the pH of solute sodium bicarbonate would fall within ranges of pH greater than seven. So would say state whether, so would say yes. Yes, pH would actually fall. So the pH range would be greater than or equal to, well, greater than, greater than seven. Let's take that out. Seven is neutral, so we expect it to be greater than seven. Would be greater than seven. In two separate experiments, iron metal, Fe, and sodium bicarbonate, NaHCO3, were both treated with excess sulfuric acid. The results of both experiments are recorded in table in table um, two below, complete the table, complete table two by stating the two inferences that can be made from the observations in experiment uh, one. So the solution um, turned pale green. So if the solution turned pale green, we know what we can, um, we can infer from that, that Fe2 plus is present, right? And if we get a colorless gas evolved and the splint goes off with a squeaky pop, we know we can say H2 hyd hydrogen gas is present. Hydrogen gas puts out um, a lighted splint with a popping sound because it's explosive. So that those would be our two inferences and we'd have gotten our two marks there. State two physical, physical properties of iron metal. So we could say it's a, it's a solid, right, at room temperature. Well, it's, it's a solid. We could also say it's a good conductor of heat and electricity. Write a chemical equation for the reaction that occurred between iron metal and the sulfuric um, acid. You know, just to go back a little, we could say iron also has high melting point, high boiling point. All right, so back to part three. So we have iron, we're looking at iron. So it would be Fe, which is a solid plus sulfuric acid. And from this, we would get iron to sulfate. And we should get hydrogen gas. That's balanced, one mark. Describe a test that can be used to confirm the identity of the carbon dioxide in, in experiment two, include your expected observation. So we could, um, in this case, bubble gas collected in lime water. And again, lime water is calcium hydroxide. And then the observation we'd expect uh, to see a white precipitate. Yeah, we don't want to say we're going to get anything cloudy. This is not the weather forecast we're doing. So wide precipitate, write a balance equation, including state symbols for the complete reaction between sodium carbonate and sulfuric, between sodium bicarbonate rather, and sulfuric acid. So sodium bi um, bicarbonates, carbonates, they react with acids to give salt and water. So we go right ahead. NaHCO3, which is a solid sulfuric acid, H2SO4. And we're going to get the salt here would be Na2SO4, CO2, water. Water is a liquid, CO2 is a gas. And of course, we'd have to, we'd have to um, balance. We're seeing Na2 on the right side, but Na on the left. So we put a two right there in front of the sodium bicarbonate. And when we do that, we realize that we now have two carbons on over this side. So to fix that, we put a two in front of the carbon dioxide. And um, let's check to see if we're now 
satisfied. We have two hydrogens on the left, two plus two, four hydrogens. And over here, we only have two, two from the water. So we put a two right there in front of the water and um, we're, good to, we're good to go. Two organic compounds, A and B, have the following molecular formula. Compound A, C3H8. Compound B, C4H8. Write the general formula for the homologous series to which compound A belong. A, C3H8. Um, the general formula there, that should be CNH2N plus two. And that's for alkane, CNH2N plus two. We don't have to write it. So we know that that's what should be going on through, through our minds. Three general characteristics of a homologous series other than the general formula. So we expect that they have the members have the members have the same functional group. And if they have the same functional group, the members would have similar chemical properties. And we could say successive, successive members differ by a CH2 group. And the homologous series to which compound B belongs, we said B was, the formula for B was C4, C4H8. So that would be alkenes. So in the spaces provided, we're to draw the fully displayed structural formula for compound A and compound B. And remember the, um, what the formula, the formulae were, we had C3H8 for A and we had C, or H8 for, for B. So we're just going to go ahead. Alkane all must be, well, all carbons must be in four bonds, C3H8, and then C4H8. So again, A is our alkane, B is our alkene. A sample of compound A was placed in test tube one and a sample of compound B was placed in test tube two. And one CM cube of acidified potassium, well, acidified permanganate solution was placed in each test tube. State what would be observed in each test tube. So for test tube one and the marks here kind of give you give you an idea of what we're supposed to, to, to put. So we would expect no visible change or the permanganate. So we'd say that the acidified, we'll call this now KMNO4 solution remains purple or no visible change on the um, compound, compound B, all right? And then for test tube, sorry, no visible change for compound A. And then for test tube um, two, which has compound B, which is our alkene, we would expect our, our um, acidified permanganate um, solution to change from purple to colorless. State whether compound B is a saturated or an unsaturated compound. Now compound B is an um, alkene, so we would know that it is an unsaturated compound. The carbons do not have all the, the they're not all taking part in carbon-carbon single, single bonds. We have carbon-carbon double bond there, so it's unsaturated. All right, some uses, uses of um, compound A, give one use of each of the following. So compound A we know is an um, al alkane, C3H8, that's um, propane. They didn't ask us for, you know, what propane, um, the name, but we know that it's propane. So we could say that it's used as a, used as a fuel 
all right? Whether for camping or it's using the, what you call those bottles, those gas pan that you, you have at home. I don't remember the name right now. All right, and then compound B, compound B, one, two, three, four, that's um, one, two, three, four, that's compound B. That would be for the one with four but butane. So we could say it's used as a precursor. for making other compounds like polymers. Four, part is from periodic table and the periodicity. Yes, and they actually put a partial representation of a periodic table. Whoa, well, they're staying true to form, periodic table and periodicity. The modern periodic table is uh, arranged such that chemical elements are grouped according to the chemical properties they exhibit. Many of the elements in the periodic table exist as a mixture of isotopes. Table three shows the symbols of selected elements in the periodic table. State the electronic configuration of SI. Let's look at SI. SI is below carbon, justify its placement in period three. So we're going to give the electronic configuration. So for SI, it is, okay, and let's do that in Old English, SI. So it's two, eight, four. And they want us to give a justification for its placement in period three. And it's placed in period three because it has three electron shells. Tells us that it's in period three, three shells. In the space provided below, draw a diagram Draw a dot and cross diagram to show the structure of the covalent bonding present in a fluorine uh, molecule. So for this one, we would do just this. Dot and cross, so we put the dots over this for the left one. And then over here, that should be fine. We're just using the symbols and the outer, just the electrons that are present in the, in the outermost um, shells. Number of protons, but different number of neutrons and hence different mass numbers. So this one now is to really see if you understand the definition here. So the element carbon has isotopes. From the list of atoms of carbon below, identify those that are isotopes. So the only ones that are isotopes here would be carbon 12 and carbon 14. But we have to ensure that the atomic number that we pick the atoms that we pick that their atomic numbers um, are six because six is what makes carbon carbon. So the seven there, carbon, the carbon with seven is, is a distraction. It's really to check to see if you truly understand the definition you just gave. Give two examples of radioisotopes and state one use of each. So two examples of radioisotopes. So we'll go with carbon, carbon 14. And we'll just give the use, use to tell the age of fossil fuels. Sorry, fossil. What, what's the word? Fossil what? Fossils. It's fossils, right? Whenever I say fossil, I automatically think um, fossil fuel. So use to tell the age of fossils. Um, we can give, well, we just want another example and um, one more. So we could use, um, this one is popular, cobalt 60, used to treat cancer cells, using the treatment of cancer. 
and they, you know there are others but we only want to give two we could have given um, plutonium 238 which is used as an energy source in pacemakers pacemakers and there are others iodine 131 used to you know detect and monitor defects of the thyroid gland there, there are several others, but we just want to give two. Magnesium and calcium are both, they both react with water, right? A chemical equation including state symbol for the reaction of calcium, whoa, with water. And they give us the, the, they give us a formula. So it's just a matter of writing. So it's calcium plus water H2, which is a liquid, and that would give us calcium hydroxide aka lime water which we can write as aqueous and that will also give us hydrogen gas h2 and of course this for this we would need um two h2 to ensure that everything is balanced an unknown element x is shown in table three on page 15. predict the order of reactivity of x magnesium and calcium with water X is below calcium in the, in, the, in, in the group that's there. So we know that reactivity increases down group two, so we'd expect X to be the most reactive, then calcium, then magnesium. So our mini reactivity series would look like this. X is more reactive than calcium, which is more reactive than magnesium towards water. Five, all right. This is coming directly from sources of, sources of um, hydrocarbons. In many Caribbean countries, hydrocarbons are used as a source of fuel. State two natural sources of hydrocarbons. So the two natural sources are crude oil, or what we call petroleum, and natural gas. Fractional distillation of a long chain hydrocarbon produces several fractions with varying numbers of carbon atoms. These Three of these fractions are shown in table four. All right, and they want us to write out um, what these, the names would be for these fractions. So one to four would be what we call refinery, refinery gases. I believe four to 12 would be um, petrol or what we call gasoline. And then 20 to 40 would be falling fuel, fuel oil or you could say lubricating oil. So that would, that would give us our marks. Figure three illustrates the process of converting long chain hydrocarbons obtained from the fractional distillation into short chain hydrocarbons in the absence of a catalyst. No catalyst has been used. State the name of the process illustrated in figure three. So we're seeing a long chain hydrocarbon it's a six chain carbon. It has six carbons in that. Six carbon chain, I should say. And then it breaks down to give us two compounds. One, two, chain long, two carbons long, and the other one, four carbons long. One, an alkene, one, an alkene. So they want us to name, to name the, the process that's happening there. That process is called cracking. State the conditions under which the process in Figure three occurs. No, they said that um, they said that no, they said that no um, catalyst has been used. Even though we know that there are two types of cracking, there is thermal cracking and there is catalytic cracking. So if they say that no catalyst has been used, we cannot um, state any catalyst. So all the catalysts that we know that would be employed for catalytic cracking, silicon four oxide, aluminum oxide, we're not, going to in, we're not going to include those because they said in the absence of a catalyst. So what we would need, the conditions that we would need here is, or are high pressure and temperature greater than or equal to 700 degrees Celsius. All right, and then they go on to ask or to state a hydrocarbon with molecular formula C4H10 is often obtained in the process illustrated in figure three. 
and they want two uses of C4H10. C4H10 is butane. So of course we know that we, it's used as a fuel. All right, we also use it as a propellant in aerosols. Propellant in aerosols. Um, it's also used as a, a heating fuel. Also used as a refrigerant. And we find that our hydrocarbons are being used to as refrigerants to replace um, their counterparts or their predecessors, um, chlorofluorocarbons due to how the fact, you know, due to the fact that chlorofluorocarbons, they result in, you know, depletion of the o, um, ozone. So we're replacing those with um, hydrocarbons. The hydrocarbon in C3 was allowed to react with bromine. The hydrocarbon in C3 was allowed to react with bromine in the presence of sunlight. Draw a fully displayed structural formula of the monobromo compound formed. So C4H10, we're just going to take off one of those um, bromine, sorry, one of those hydrogens and replace it with, with a bromine. That's a monobromo compound. So we need one bromine. The bromine could go anywhere. It could go anywhere. So I'm just going to put it right here on that one. And then I just put, put on the hydrogens for the rest. The type of reaction that occurred in C, part four, between the hydrocarbon and the bromine the type of reaction, type of reaction is what we call a substitution reaction. Propane is another hydrocarbon obtained in one of the fractions during fractional distillation, right? A balanced equation, including state symbols for the complete combustion of propane. Propane, prop three, so it's C3H8. Propane is a gas plus O2 gas. And of course we're going to get carbon dioxide, which is a gas and would get water in this form would be a gas. So we're burning, it would not come off as a liquid. Of course, we're normally balancing the order, Cho, CH then O. So we need a three here for the carbon. Then for the H we need four over this side, four two is eight, then we count four, Oxygen here plus three to six, that's 10. So it means we need five right here. And that should do it. Six, the metal question, and this has to do with application of electrolysis, I believe. The ores of aluminum and iron are both oxides, yes. Discuss the differences in methods used. Discuss the differences in methods used to extract aluminum and iron from their ore in relation to their positions in the electrochemical series. So the, the elements at the top, so we, when we look at the electrochemical series, the elements at the top, they are, they are most reactive. They're more reactive than the elements at the, the bottom. So reactivity of the elements increases of the group. And if they're more reactive, then it means that their ores, when they form compounds, the compounds are very stable and they would be more difficult to break down. If they're more difficult to break down or they're more difficult to decompose, it means that we're going to need a powerful, a more, a more powerful extraction um, technique to actually get them, get the metals from their ores. And you know, that method um, tends to be, if it's more powerful, it tends to be more expensive. So the elements at the top that are more reactive require the most powerful technique that can be employed to extract them from their ores. So that's where electrolysis would come in. So as you go down, you find that like our zinc, iron, and lead that are not as reactive as our sodium, calcium, magnesium, aluminum, they would require um, a less powerful, a less powerful um, technique to be used to extract them. And then as you go down, the, you realize that reactivity decreases and then you find that these compounds now start to um, occur more naturally. For example, our silver and our gold. So our copper, we can roast in air, but our zinc, iron, and lead, we would need to heat it with carbon or carbon monoxide, coke, 
for the process to actually, for the process to, for the extraction to take place. So we could heat or we could reduce using carbon or, or coke, all right? So let's, let's go, go back. So they say we should, we should, um, we should discuss discuss the difference in methods used to extract aluminum and iron from their ores in relation to their positions in the electrochemical series. So we could say that metals high in the electrochemical series are more reactive and form more stable compounds than metals lower in the series. So Al is higher than Fe and would therefore require a more powerful extraction technique to get the metal from its ore than iron. AL, AL would require electrolysis. You could say it in less words. We have different idiolects, but as long as we get the, as long as we get the, the answer out. While, and would say FE, for FE we would use, um, what do we call it? What's the one, what, what, did, what, what did we say? We would use, um, burning it in carbon in the blast furnace, burning with carbon in blast furnace. I think some of my answer for the first part actually was for this part as well. Explain which of the methods described in that above would be more suitable. So um, electrolysis, okay, there we go. Okay, oh, this is a different question. I didn't read that properly. So, um, Explain which of the methods discussed in A would be more suitable for the extraction of lead from its ore. Again, we'd have to look to see where lead falls. Let's look to see where lead falls, all right? So if you look in the series, you'll find that lead is, is um, just below um, iron. So we would not use electrolysis. Electrolysis is for the, um, the ones at the top that are that are very reactive and form very stable compounds. So electrolysis would be for the ones at the top, but for lead, we would use the same, the same technique of reduce um, burning it with carbon, with coke, similar to what happens in the, in the blast furnace. And this is a little um, diagram of the blast furnace um, here. So that's, that's the technique that we would um, employ. That technique would be more suitable seeing that that, so that technique would be more suitable seeing that lead, you know, is a little bit below iron in the, in the series. So explain which of the two, which of the metals discussed above. So burning with, um, burning with carbon in the blast furnace, coke or carbon would be more suitable to extract PB from PB, what's that, from PBO2 or, or lead from its ore, PB from its ore. So it would not, it does require as powerful a technique So it would not require as powerful a technique as AL, or we could say it, it could work with the same technique you employed for, for iron. And they want two um, equations to show, to show um, the process to produce lead from lead for oxide. So we would need to show carbon or coke burning with ox, burning in oxygen to give us carbon monoxide. So coke is a, solid carbon plus O2 gas to give CO gas. And of course, 
balance. And then we would take the carbon monoxide now to actually go to react with the lead or oxide. Similar to what happens in the blast furnace. So we're just using the knowledge from the blast furnace to actually to actually answer this one. The lead here would be molten, so it would be PB, liquid, and we would get CO2, gas. Um, balance, so we need two right there, and then that would, be, that would be it. That would be it. Similar to the blast furnace, so it's just a transfer of the um, knowledge from blast furnace over to this, to this part application if you know it for one and you, you know you know how um, it is to extract to extract iron similar principle based on where iron falls in the electrochemical series state some metals and their compounds are important to living systems whereas others could be harmful consider aluminum lead iron and their compounds explain the usefulness of one metal explain the usefulness of one metal and the harmfulness of one metal to live in system. Okay, so we could just pick one and we give the usefulness of one and the harmfulness of one to live in system. So useful, we could go um, with Fe, iron, living systems we're talking about. So we know that the Fe, Fe or iron forms the heme group in hemoglobin, which carries oxygen around the body. All right, so we can we can pretty much um, stop there. The harmfulness of one metal to living system. And you know, the moment we're looking at harmfulness, then boy, we should just think of lead. Harmfulness of lead. Now, lead. So, lead, we could say it harms the central nervous system, especially. The brain in young children. That's why um, the paints that are used on toys, they cannot be uh, made of lead, lead cannot be in it. They also, it results in loss of, results in loss of cognitive abilities. Antisocial behavior, nausea, etc., vomiting, etc. All right, so we just can we can, we can just leave it there. They just want one of them, and that would have been that would be it. That would be it. Would have gotten full marks there.